So here is the refresher. This is from this morning. So I told you there was SR1, SR2, SR3, the amount that we received, the date that it was awarded, and the deadline to spend. 90% of ESSER funds to LEA school districts. That's The feds always say LEA, it's local education agency. We call them school districts based on the Title I free and reduced um, lunch formula. 10% must be set aside and used by the SEA. That stands for State Education Agency for statewide efforts. 20% of all school district funds must be spent on services to students, on services to students to accelerate learning recovery. All expenditures must relate to preventing, preparing for, or responding to COVID-19. So those are some basic parameters of what the ESSER funds can be used for. Learning loss, 20%. This is the status of our ESSER funding right now. Um, you'll see the amounts that were allocated to school districts. You'll see the funds expended to date. This is June of 2021, excuse me, June of 2022. That's how much has been funded. So of the 30 million, um, 28 million has been extended in ESSER 1 of 123.4, 39.5 has been spent. Of the 275 million from ESSER 3, 26.7 million has been spent. And then the last bullet, you'll see how much is left. So we currently have over, oh my gosh, almost, Holy cats, we're gonna have $320 million left to spend. <clears throat> this is what reported uses of funds have been spent on by our school districts. This is a state level snapshot. Uh, most of it has been spent on education technology at 20.23%, mental health supports 2.59%, most to least. And so that's the um, descending order there. You don't have this PowerPoint, but we'll get it to you. More, so we'll just go back here. Educational technology at 20.23. Least emergency responses, other activities, construction projects. Construction projects, you would think that you're seeing and hearing a lot of construction projects going on because of ESSER, but because these are federal funds, there is a whole lot of um, strings tied to using these federal funds for uh, construction projects, like even down to contracting and who you hire and the notices that you need to put out and the bidding uh, procedures, all of those things that go along with federal funds. So a lot of our school districts, you will probably hear, are doing construction projects or remodels or updates. It's kind of been a shell game. They have moved general funds into construction projects and then used the ESSER funds to replace those general funds. So they're not actually using the ESSER funding. They are using the ESSER funding for things that they had previously been using general funds for. And that's part of what's going on. <clears throat> IDEA, 0.44, Perkins, ESSA, Adult Education, Indian, and long-term closures. We do not have long-term closures in North Dakota, so I'm glad to see nobody spent any money in there. So this is what we've spent. This is the department, uh, the SEA. This is what we've used our 10% set aside. Um, we've partnered with DHS. I told you 95% of a child's brain is developed by the age of five recognizing that if we're gonna curb behavioral problems in kindergarten and first grade, which is where most of our behavioral problems are occurring, we need to invest. So we've granted $9 million to the Department of Human Services, our partners who are in charge, the legislature has put them in charge of the zero to five programming. So early learning, best in class, Waterford Upstart, which is a family engagement um, for four-year-olds, bridge to the Commerce Grants. We have expanded our comprehensive literacy sites with $5 million grant, we've uh, provided professional development science of reading. It aligns to our goal that I talked about at the very beginning of um, every student needs to be reading on grade level by the end of third grade. Um, after school programming, we knew that worked. We need to double down on that. Uh, grow your own teacher shortages. That's when we were talking about teacher shortages. We've invested 1.83 
in that financial transparency website. That's to help you all as school board members and your constituents to find out exactly how much your school is spending and on what. So that's just to help you and your constituents. School food innovation grants, partnerships with REAs to create priority standards. So there were some school districts that did not get any money because the money was delivered out through a formula as I told you, that formula is what is our Title I grant. That Title I grant is given to schools based on how many students in their school that are on free and reduced. So identified as living in poverty or socio socioeconomically disadvantaged. Some schools didn't have students that were socio socioeconomically disadvantaged. But this department recognized that they had COVID just as much as any of them did. Maybe they're middle income kids, or maybe the, so we granted some of our funds to those, so every school in the state got some funding to help. We did a single sign-on for math and reading. This is pre-K through 12th grade. Every school district had the opportunity to um, come on to the state contract, and it was uh, for personalized, in the moment, at your child's need. We opened it up to private, public, and homeschool families and school districts. This is uh, online teacher professional development. We recognize that our teachers didn't know how to teach online, so we provided professional development to help them become better teachers as an online teacher. Multi-tiered system of support, choice ready grants, uh, district incentivizing cost sharing of district administration. Mr. Tesha talked about that a little bit. Um, if there is, are districts out there that are having trouble finding a superintendent, the state will incentivize you sharing a superintendent with another school district. We are we have the summer parks learning. You maybe saw some news programs about that, and then the math innovation zones. Be legendary school board leadership. This is our investment in you. I'll talk about that in the next session in great detail. But as as we talk about this quality education personnel, I've. I clearly said that you are all education personnel as well. We've invested $500,000 in a program investing in you. Personalized competency-based learning scale work, that's the $500,000 that we that we have committed to try to scale out the work of Oaks, Northern Cass, West Fargo, and YCC to get train the trainers and replicate that cohort. Special education unit grants and high impact tutoring. So, um, when the, co when the ESSER funding came out, our legislature was in session. And all of them were like, well, we should tell the school districts to do X, Y, and Z. Well, we need to have our school districts do X, Y, and Z. And the congressional acts were very, very clear. They said a state cannot tell districts what to do with the money. It will go to the SEA, DPI in this case, and SEAs will deliver it out to our school districts based on this formula. And then the boards in those districts make decisions about how they're supposed to spend it, how they need to spend it, and can best spend it. Once the legislature figured out that they couldn't tell you all what to do, they then said, well then, those good people are gonna tell us what they did. And they required a report. And so these are, that's House Bill 1013. Um, they specifically, wanted a report from you all about what you were doing to address learning loss. Our legislature was very concerned about that missed school time. They were also understood clearly that even though our kids were in school face to face more than most other states, students in other states, chaos was occurring in our lives. The learning loss was real. And they wanted to know what our school districts were going to do with 400, nearly half a billion dollars from the federal government, what you were doing to address that. They also wanted to know specifically what we're doing in the schools to close the gaps. Like, what are you doing to make sure that the Native American students, what are you doing that those students in poverty, and what are you doing specifically to close the learning gaps for students with disabilities? So that's included in the report. Um, they want, and they wanted to know what impact is that having on our learning? Because the legislature is saying, schools are always asking for more money. 
This is an unprecedented time in our lives, in this country, where a half a billion dollars is being delivered out to our local school boards to make decisions on. And if we can't prove that money is gonna make a difference with a half a billion dollars, then the legislature was saying, don't come to us again and tell us that money, that lack of money is the problem. So that's why they included, what is the impact these dollars are having on our learning of our students? And so they're requiring us to provide a return on an ROI, return on investment. And they've asked, they, they, as, as my bosses, as the legislature, <coughs> told me your job as state superintendent to make sure that you collect this information and provide evidence to us that more money makes a difference for our kids. So, so the first report was due to us, to the department, December of 2021, and I provided a report to, the, to Senator Shively's Education Funding Committee in June. Districts reported significant student learning loss among 48% of the school of districts reported learning loss among students with disabilities. 39 reported low income students, 17 English learners, and one or more racial subgroups or, or ethnic subgroups, 30%. To better understand the impact of the students' instructional loss of the impact of students' lost instructional time, we partnered with SAS Analytics. It's a company um, Founded in partnership with the University of North Carolina, and they have SAS EVOS. So, what this analyst of the analytics did, this analysis, looked at students' previous years' learning trajectory, all of our students in the state, the previous years' learning trajectory on our scores, math and reading and writing, so math and ELA. They made a prediction of based on student X scoring here, here, and here, had there not been a pandemic, we would expect that that student would have been here. So they did that projection, and then they actually compared the projected achievement for each student to where they actually were in the 2021 state assessment on math and ELA. <clears throat> this analysis investigated decline across subjects and grades, across schools and districts. We're able to compare which schools did better, which schools had significant declines, which demographic of students did more poorly or better, and across student groups. Um, the purpose of that is to not only know where we are, but if we see exemplars, what is working with Native American students in Western North Dakota that could be replicated with a similar group? That's why we did this. So what were the findings? So it actually is, is pretty promising. English language arts test scores for students in grades five through eight and 10 tended to come in close to pre-pandemic expectations. So we were actually close in our reading and writing. We, where, they, where they would have been without the pandemic, they actually were. It is much less, <clears throat> two other states have done this, and it's not Tennessee, it is um, Ohio. I'm sorry, it's North Carolina and Ohio. They run similar ana analysis and a national studies. North Dakota is better. We have less learning loss from the, what they projected to be to what it actually was, then two other states that did this exact same study and other national studies based on some other things. <clears throat> but here's the bad news. Math scores for students in grades five through eight and 10 suffered an observable amount of learning decline in our state. Students in some schools and districts across North Dakota met or exceeded pre-pandemic expectations. So think about that. Some schools and districts, whatever they implemented on the fly, pivoting to virtual, using exact path, leveraging high impact tutoring, doubling down with this tremendous amount of money by 
opening up more um, after school programs, having more students allowed to come into their summer school program, partnering with their own local parks. Some of those districts exceeded the projected expectation. About 40% of our schools and districts met or exceeded expectations in ELA, and 30% met or exceeded expectations in math. That's incredible. So now the, we're contracting, with, we're working out a contract negotiation with SAS again to use some of our state set-aside funds to dig further in who are those school districts and what did they do? And being able to share that. Because we still have 60% of our school districts that didn't make those learning gains in ELA and 70% that didn't make them in math. So we've got to help, we've got to find out what worked in 40 and 30% and help those other 60 and 70%. Overall, students with all levels of entering achievement experience similar levels of learning decline. So students that were here, here, or here, all experienced about the same level of loss. Nobody really fell off the cliff. Some student groups saw differences in learning, compliant, learning decline, though, compared to peers but they also mirrored the pre-pandemic differences. In some cases, the gap widened. Um, these include students with disabilities, English learners. So all students were achieving here. Before the pandemic, students with disabilities were achieving here. After the pandemic, it was like this. What just happened? What did I do? Okay. There we go. So the places where the gap widened Students with disabilities, English learners, students in poverty, students identified as homeless, and our males. Our boys experienced a greater level of learning loss compared to the group as a whole. Differences in the gap between Native Americans compared to other race, races and ethnicities greatly increased in magnitude compared to the pre-pandemic. Native American students experienced significant learning decline during the pandemic. We might hypothesize that because Native, Native American students had met great gains closing the learning gap the past several years, their expected trajectory was particularly impacted by the disruption in the learning supports that they had been receiving. We plan to meet with tribal and educational leaders to dive more deeply into this. So 90% of our schools have Native American students in them, yes. Speaks to the chaos that was in their lives. So when you're experiencing that death and you're experiencing that trauma and grieving, you can't attend to learning math and figuring out solving for X as much. So yes, I, I absolutely do. <clears throat> so one thing that makes this bullet point a little, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit more understandable is in 2013 I took office and looked at the 2012 graduation rates of our state. We any, we graduate about 80 to, I mean, can you give me some water? 89 to 90% of our students graduate every year. That is one of the highest in the nation. That's something to be proud of. It's not 100% where we need to be, but it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty high. When I looked in 2013, the 2012 graduation rate for our Native American students was 52%. I was like, wow, none of us should be happy with that. Native American students make up about 10% of our students pop, of our state's student population. So when you have 10% of your state's population graduating at half the rate, you're gonna have economic problems for your state for a long, long time. 
your state, they're, they're not going to be able to fill those jobs. We have a workforce issue in North Dakota. There's the social service costs. There's, you know, the list goes on and on. So just economically, I mean, let's set aside the humanities, you know, portion of everybody should graduate because they're going to have better lives. Let's just do this pure economics. When half of your, half of 10% of your state's population is not graduated from high school, we are, we should address that. So we doubled down on, at the department and funded a lot of programs, um, created some essential understanding, some relevant materials, visiting with uh, our, the elders of the sovereign nations that we share our borders with in North Dakota. Fast forward to pre-pandemic, the graduation rate in 2019 for Native American students, 83%. 83% which meant that the supports that they were getting, the way that their teachers had been trained, the way that they understood how to help Native American students, so that trajectory was really, really high. When you remove those supports because everybody's in lockdown because our Native American population is experiencing death and trauma and are closed more, um, more substantially than others, that is why that gap probably widened. But it should be encouraging to all of us as educators, and from now on you will all be called educators because you work in the education profession. So that should be encouraging to all of us as educators because what we did made a difference. And so if we just keep doing that, it's not like throwing money into a bottomless well, right? If we keep doing that, it makes a difference. And when those supports and those students are back in school with those teachers and that relevant curriculum and that relevant materials, they can get, I mean, we need to be 90%. We need to be, for our Native Americans, we need to be 100% and if North Dakota's gonna reach its fullest potential. But that explains that a little bit more. So, districts plan to use a variety of strategies. Most common are the new additional technology reported by 80% of districts, hiring additional personnel that was mentioned. Um, you're not alone in North Dakota or in the, the nation, 78%. Health-related support, 71%. New curriculum, 70%. Districts planned efforts to close subgroups gaps varied widely. For example, some are reviewing IEPs and increasing minutes of service for students showing significant loss. Some are incentivizing teachers to earn credentials, endorsements to serve students with disabilities or English learners. This is district self-report. Districts reported a range of positive outcomes resulting from accelerated learning recovery. 43% reported an increase in learning in math and LEA, and 14% increased reported increased learning in other subjects. So that self-reporting aligns pretty well with what the um, SAS analytics out of UNC have shared with us. This is our state assessment. So this is the English math state assessment. Um, so what you see here is state assessment spring of 2019. This column is important. So for English, in third grade, 47% were proficient in reading and writing. All then 44 for grade four, 46, 49, 46, 50, 46. Not wonderful, right? I mean, you're going to go into any of your classrooms and divide half of your class and say, you guys get to read and you guys don't. This is where we're at for math. Here's where we were. Again, I wish that I could have them side by side. It's easier. But here's where we are pandemic, post-pandemic. 29%. 39%, I said 38 this morning, I'm sorry, it's 39%. 39% in third grade. This is where, it's positive news again. This is, okay, so this was the 21 data, this is our first year back after the pandemic. Use this money, use this funding, are we trending in the right direction? Yep, for most areas. But grade three reading stayed flat. We increased in all but grade eight in reading. We increased in math 
kind of, sort of. That's why the department is investing in math innovation zones, because something happens. This is, I'm going to start to, I'm going to try and make this as, as simple as possible, but math is where it becomes most evident when you use time as the constant and learning as the variable. Math is the easiest to say, to, 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 to demonstrate. You learn a standard, a math concept or a math skill in fourth grade, let's just say it's double digit division. If you master that in fourth grade, you've got it. You move on to fifth grade math, you move on to sixth grade math, you move on to seventh grade math. Eighth grade math, you're gonna need that skill that you have, that, that you were supposed to master in fourth grade. It builds, it builds. And if you never mastered that skill, good luck trying to build it. It's like a very shaky foundation, very shaky. But we push kids through instead of giving them one semester and three more weeks where learning would have been the constant and time was the variable. It's gonna take some kids four weeks to get through it. It's gonna take some kids 13 weeks to get through it but we've got to make sure they master it. And that's why we see this, is because these kids are doing okay, but more and more of this learning is dependent on this learning. And when you only have 49 and 37% mastering it, they're, they're, we're just setting them up to fail. So we're creating some math innovation zones to support this. And this is why it's important for you as, as decision makers about policy and money to understand what's going on in academics, and I'll get to that in my next presentation, but it all kind of bleeds together. So, so the next steps. ESSER funds have been provided to North Dakota schools with, ne they are a necessary lifeline. Districts have a lot of autonomy. You all have sole authority about how you're gonna make those decisions as long as they're within the federal guidelines. Given this discretion, transparency and accountability remain top priorities. Be transparent with your constituents. Hold yourselves accountable as board members to each other and for each other. Hold your community and your school community and your leaders that you hire accountable. Hold yourselves accountable and be transparent. DPI remains committed to supporting our schools while providing support in this accountability and transparency to our citizens as districts continue to spend real funds. DPI will receive another update from our schools December 1st of this year, and we pro will provide another report like I've just done. This was the report that I gave to the interim committee, to Senator Shively's committee. I'll provide this report again to our 68th Legislative Assembly when they convene in January. Okay. Now, Patty, can you help me get started? So any questions on that before I move into the next session, which is me again. You guys are gonna get sick of talking to me. No questions? That's why it's fun to be a school board member. There's so much opportunity. Um, Oh, while she's doing that, I'll tell another little story. <clears throat> when I was elected to the Mandan School Board, we were the lowest performing Class A school district in the state. It was Mandan. Um, I grew up in a family that uh, my mom and dad said, God, family, country. And so that was service, right? So I thought, how do I get involved in my community? And I just really wanted my boys' hometown. I'm from Flasher, really small school in southwestern North Dakota. Um, and I was really proud of my hometown, still am. I wanted my boys to be equally proud of being a Mandan brave, as I was a Flasher Bulldog. Uh, but they weren't, I and mean, we didn't have that opportunity. And it just, it was the lowest performing. And there was lots of reasons for that. But when the school board got engaged, we had a nine member board. We were the lowest performing school district in the state. Um, we had been to impasse for four negotiation sessions in a row. That's eight years. We were fighting all the time. And when we were, adults were spending that much time on big people issues, it showed in our students' achievement. We had to turn that around. 
and we had to start talking about the things that were important, the reasons that we existed as a school board. And I'm happy to report, and this is probably one of the reasons that um, uh, I decided to run for the state superintendent, because then um, uh, Governor Jack Dalrymple called and said, I've been watching you on the school board meetings. It looks like you turned your things around. When in 2011, um, Mandan School District, high school scores were the highest in the state, except for two other high schools that had significantly different demographics than um, Mandan <coughs> students did. And so that's what can happen when you start talking about the things that matter the most. And that's what leads me to this. Student outcomes do not change until adult behaviors change. Hands down, 100%, I'm convinced of it. Student outcomes will never change until adult behaviors change. Because you were elected, your <coughs> students couldn't vote because they're not 18, yet you're making the decisions about policy and funding <coughs> that hold their future in your hands. So why are we here? What is the why? <coughs> Schools exist to improve student outcomes, period, hands down, full stop. School boards can create the context for improvements in student outcomes, but many school boards don't choose to do that. What can school boards do to accomplish the why? How can you improve student outcomes? There's gonna be lots of pressure on you by a lot of adults in your sphere, in your community. A lot of the voters that voted for you. A lot of the adults that voted for you. There's gonna be contract issues. There's gonna be zoning issues. There's gonna be boundary issues. There's gonna be building issues. There's gonna be working conditions issues. But unless you remember the why, why are you here? To graduate students that are prepared to do whatever they choose to do after they graduate from high school. Four school board behaviors based on research, beginning back with the Iowa Lighthouse study more than two decades ago now. The Iowa Lighthouse study proved effective school boards that were focused on asking questions about how are our students doing had students that performed better on every measure. Outcomes, graduation, college education, work placement, the list goes on and on. But what needs to happen is boards need to clarify their priority. They need to monitor the progress of their priorities. They need to communicate the results to all of the stakeholders, to their teachers, to their citizens to their um, students, to their families. And then they need to align their resources to those priorities. If the board president drives by a school building and sees that the lawn has some dandelion in it, we have to move for a while, pulls into the superintendent's office and starts to you know, sit down with the superintendent and say, Hey, I just drove by Lewis and Clark Elementary. It looks like. You want to know what that superintendent's going to spend his time doing that morning? Getting all of his buildings and grounds people together and saying, hey, our board president just stopped by, had a sit down with me, and our football field looks like crap. Or our, you know, we haven't had a winning season. Or he just mentioned to Lewis and Clark Elementary looks like you know it, it, it's been forgotten about. You need to get over there. Imagine if that board president or board member swings into the superintendent's office and says, "You know what? 39% reading. We were at 44% before. I know the pandemic took a hit, but what are we doing? What do you think the superintendent's going to spend his time doing? Visiting with his principals, building, visiting with his lead teachers, visiting. Not your job to make those decisions." But your job to say, hey, 39% isn't okay. What are we going to do? 
your superintendent and your business manager are hired by you, evaluated by you, but it shouldn't, you shouldn't have an agenda that is full of all of these other things that contribute to the functioning of a properly run school district, but not the purpose. Purpose of public education in, in the United States isn't to have nice looking buildings. They add to the ability to learn but when you're only asking questions about the buildings or the roof or the labs and not asking questions about where are our third graders at in reading, then your why is off. If your resources aren't aligned, then it's off a little bit. So when is it time for school boards to shoulder that responsibility of how well your school districts, $400 million have been given to you to make decisions about. Don't put that all on the shoulders of two people. Your constituents are wanting their students to achieve. They've trusted you enough to vote for you. If these four things aren't done first, and in this order, if school boards do not make the main thing, the main thing in your schools, in your districts, in your communities, everything else that you do is less likely to serve students. Yes? Adults may be happier, but students will suffer. The eight years of impasse with student negotiations that I talked about, big people were fighting and little people were suffering. So how can you guys focus on these things? There are, four other, there are many things that school boards can do. Hiring the superintendent, setting the goals of where do you want your students to be, finding out first, where are our students? Number two, where do we want them to be? Set that goal with your superintendent and his or her principals and curriculum directors. Approve budgets that empower your superintendent and their leadership team to get those goals accomplished. Let them do the work but then ask them to provide the progress. If those things are not aligned with school why school districts exist and what school boards can do to make the biggest difference, then outcomes for students are far less likely to improve. With a half, nearly half a billion dollars, we have this opportunity with your leadership. So, to support that work, DPI is providing support for school boards that want to be ahead of other school districts in regard to their focus on student outcomes. This is the North Dakota B Legendary School Board Institute. It is a two-day workshop that is, occurs in your school district community. I've been through this. Our chief of staff has been through this. Alexis has been through this of the School Boards Association. In our first cohort, we had nine school districts take us up on the offer. Dickinson, Belcourt, Rugby, Carrington, Sergeant Central, Ellendale, Dunsey, Negros. 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 Not Dunsey. Who else are we? Rugby, Carrington, Ned Rose, Dickinson, Belfort, Elmdale, Okay. So those school districts have gone through this initial two-day institute. Your board goes through it together. You take a look at where you are. The process is you take a look on North Dakota Insights. Please write this down. Insights, I-N-S-I-G-H-T-S dot N-D dot gov. Insights N-D dot gov. You click on that. You can look up your school and you can find out exactly how your students are doing in reading, writing and math, science, what the graduation rate is, how many of your students are graduated choice ready. You can do that by grade level. You can do it by demographics. Find out where your students are. This training has you sit down Take a look at where your largest needs are, what your greatest gap is. You do that with your superintendent and his or her leadership team, whoever you decide to invite to that. At 
after that two-day training, there is an opportunity um, to have ongoing coaching. So here's, here's the beautiful thing. DPI covers 50% of the cost for the initial two-day training. And right now, up to 100% of the cost for that initial ongoing coaching for at least one year. So the time commitment after that initial two-day training, they work on board leadership with the superintendent. You're assigned a coach that has experience in this. You meet monthly with this coach and before each board meeting to discuss the agenda. What are you talking about? How are you making sure that you're keeping the main thing the main thing? There's multiple coach and school leadership meetings to prepare for monitoring reports, and that's kind of in the details. But most importantly, I encourage each and every one of you, we're opening another grant round to another set of school districts for this upcoming year. At the very least, especially those of you with some significantly larger numbers of new board members, even if you don't, even if your board has stayed the same, get together, commit to two days of just understanding where you're at and helping your superintendent set goals and letting your superintendent know that that, that weight is not all on his or her shoulders. That you as a board know where your students are. That they, your superintendent doesn't have to go it alone. You're in this with them. And you want to provide the, the support, the resources, and the, the ability to make gains on reading, writing, and math. Um, so these are just some more specifics about the ongoing training. And I'll just end with, student outcomes do not change <laughs> until adult behaviors change. So many of you, you know, we talked about doing the budget the same way and just doing it because that's the way we did it last year. Many of you who are new would, might say, well, I'll just go to the meeting and I kind of know what my predecessor did. For those of you that are veteran board members that have said, you know what, I got this, we do the budget in July, we do you know, the annual report in August, and we've got the school boards convention in October. Think about doing things differently because just take a look at where your scores are. If you're, if you're a school in the state that's got 90% reading proficiency, well then maybe it is okay to do what you, you've been doing. But when 39%, I can say that the majority of us in this room would not be in a school district that where we should be able to say we're, we're good. We can just keep doing what we're doing. So the Be Legendary North Dakota School Board Institute, I know that there were some flyers around. Um, it helps you adopt student outcome goals, adopt progress measures, monitor your student outcomes, you structure for success, you adopt guardrails to make sure that you're holding yourselves accountable for being, doing board work, and you're holding the superintendent, your CEO, and your business manager, the CFO, accountable for their work. Everybody stays in their lane. Active teamwork and advocacy. So on the back is the cost of this two-day training. If one school board decides to go it alone, it's not as if they can do it, but the experts, we modeled this after Lone Star Governance, a governance model in Texas, Research has shown and evidence has been provided that it's better when two boards come together for this two-day training. They learn from each other. So, but if you want to go alone, the cost is $8,700. DPI will pay 50%, and so a board cost is $4,350. Two boards, the cost goes down. For a board, board cost would be $3,125. The maximum that should go together is three school boards, and that's a cost of $2,583. The governor and I are partnering on this, and so you will be recognized. Any board that goes through this training, those boards that we mentioned received recognition at the Governor's Innovative Education Summit. You'll receive individual certificates as a individual board member, and boards will be recognized with a, a plaque that's saying that you had completed the two-day Be Legendary Institute. And then um, Dickinson, what other school districts have chosen to uh, pr go on? We've got two of them, but one of them um, still thinking about it. So is it Negros? I think it might be Negros. 
So two of the school districts that have gone through the two-day institute have said, yeah, we want that coach. We need to keep doing this. This is good. So go back, visit with your superintendent, visit with your other board members, have this executive leadership meeting that is necessary to keep the main thing the main thing, um, to make sure that you're able to report that progress. Uh, maybe I'm a little selfish. That would give me a good report to provide to the 68th Legislative Assembly. It's like, this is what a half a billion dollars can do, and we should keep that up. Um, because if not, then then we've lost a great opportunity. So. Did you take for the initial two-day training you come to the district? Yes. All of, yes, the initial two-day training. Generally, if you do it alone, the, the trainers, and so it's not DPI that does this. And SEA does not have the capacity, nor should we. We're not experts in school board training. We've partnered with experts in, and people that have uh, experience and expertise in helping school boards do this work. It's a firm called <coughs> Elliott and McMahon. So interestingly enough, North Dakota was highlighted in Forbes last week. I can have Patty send that link out to you. So Forbes learned about the North Dakota Bee Legendary School Board Institute and the training that we've done, and they recognized it as one of the few things that they've learned that is occurring in this nation that could truly have an impact using COVID funding. So they felt that it was one of the most promising practices that any state was doing to increase student achievement in the nation. And so, I mean, not that Forbes is our barometer, but I believe that if we're ever going to raise student achievement from the levels that they are today in North Dakota, it does begin with you. You are the decision makers. You are the appropriators. So, um, I think that's it. Any questions on that? I should mention that on the manual, and you'll see this here, the logo is North Dakota Department of Public Instruction, the North Dakota School Boards Association, and Elliot McMahon, the trainer, the experts. Texas did not have such a wonderful relationship. Um, as we were developing this, we reached out to Alexis and said, um, we'd really like to partner. We see the School Boards Association as the main driver of this eventually. We can use COVID funding. The, the story behind this is Alexis and I and Senator Shively and the president of the North Dakota School Boards Association, Donna Fishbeck, some others from North Dakota, went down to Texas to participate in this two-day training. We went back to our hotel room, ordered some food, some pizza, and we thought, how can we do this? And funding was the barrier. It's like, where are we going to get the funding to train the trainers, to build these people out, to get, you know, to, to do this? And we didn't know. COVID hit a month later and turned our worlds upside down, but then suddenly there was some funding. So I called Alexis again and said, we're going to contract, we're going to do this. You know, can you partner with us? And Alexis said, yes. Other states have not been so collaborative, but that's why when big people fight, little people suffer. So big people don't fight. We just work together. And so um, I think that's, that's a, a good thing to end in as we move into resources. So please, Dada Fishback is the point on this one. Uh, Dr. Fishback, former Vice President of the Indian School Board, better known as. So please, seriously consider it. We'd love to have all of your schools. Engage eventually, all of them. All right, I'm not saying